Good afternoon and welcome to Strategic Farm Winter Week 2020. Um, it's brilliant to have you all with us here today. Um, now I'm going to introduce the, this session and then and then hand over to, to our um, esteemed speakers. Um, hopefully you've seen all the kind of the handouts and the videos and the other resources that are going on around Strategic Farm Week this week. Um, you'll notice in the on the right hand side in the box there's a handouts handouts um, box there that where you can see some of the the Strategic Farm um, resources that we've pulled together today. My name is Richard Meredith. Um, I'm your. I mean, it's my pleasure to be your chair for for this afternoon's session. We'd usually be together in a hall or a. Um, I think Rob, last time you and I did this, we were in a, a wedding marquee somewhere in in Gloucester, a very cold day, so it's a bit warmer this time. <laughs> but we would usually be in a hall, kind of welcoming you all in for some some bacon rolls and coffee. Um, we're not we're not together today, obviously. And if we were together, then a key element of having you all with us would be discussing and um, challenging and bringing all of your experiences together. And um, and I suppose what I'm trying to say is that that kind of your questions and your 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 thoughts today are really kind of vital into kind of driving the the kind of QA Q and A section that we run at the end and throughout um, the the content. So, Christian, if you go to the next slide, please. The housekeeping is is the usual um, stance. You're, um, nobody can hear you. You're all muted. Apart from the speakers, you're all muted. So we can't hear or see you. Don't panic. Um, like I said, the questions um, are vital to, to kind of driving, driving this. Um, the question box is on, on the right hand side um, and you should be able to kind of easily put in, put in any thoughts and questions there. Um, we've allowed for for an hour and a half. Um, we, we'll see how we get on, whether whether we use all that and kind of and play it by ear. Um, but we have got that total time available. We're also recording this, um, so if you're frantically making notes or, or anything, um, we you, there is an opportunity afterwards to to pick this up off the HDB Cereals and All Seeds YouTube site. Um, we usually get them turned around with kind of between 20, 24 and forty eight hours afterwards. So don't be afraid to 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 to, to look at them up afterwards. Um, Christian, if you go on to the next slide, just to kind of cover off that we um, we have got basis and the Rosso points um, for, for these in the chat box, in the question box, if you put your your um, basis account number and postcode and your name, and then similar for for Neroso, your Neroso number, um, your postcode and your name, and also your date of birth for that one, please. Um, so please do do share them, and and we'll we'll make sure that we um, put put it all up. So next slide, please, Christian. I suppose. Um, we want to take the opportunity to to promote that we are um, recruiting a new strategic farm host. Rob is um, the strategic farm west. There is also Brian Barker in the, in the Suffolk in the east, and David Aglin up at Balburnie Farms in Scotland. This leaves a bit of a gap in the south and the north of of England. And on the slide there, you can see the the kind of counties that we're we're targeting. Um, could you be the next cereals um, strategic farm host? If you think so, then please contact us and make yourself known to us, um, because we'd love to we'd love to get to know a bit more about you and whether this kind of this excellent program would fit with you. The hosts are. They're not always perfect, as Rob, Rob will, will probably agree with, but they're, <laughs> they're they're always striving to be the best in their field and striving to be the best in what they can do. And they're really taking HDB research and putting that into practice on their farms. And, that, and that's the kind of underpinning pinning part of all the strategic farms. It's kind of taking that research and demonstrating it on in a commercial environment. It's a six-year tenure, so it's quite a um, quite a commitment. But we really kind of like. Um, hopefully Rob would agree with me that it's quite an exciting journey that we all go on together. Next slide please. So the format for today, um, I mentioned Rob, the, the strategic farm host from, from the west. Um, Rob will be giving us a, a introduction into to weed management on his on his farm. Uh, why are we all here today? What, what, why is this a, a subject that's kind of close to his heart and also on the, the programme for the strategic farms? Then we're joined by Sarah Cook from ADAS. Sarah has um, helped assist in, in designing this trial that we're doing for, for against black grass, and um, she'll be explaining that and kind of some of the assumptions that we can make um, as we go before we go into it and what, what we can expect to see and, and how it's been driven. Then we've got a bit of a, a kind of a, a curveball. We've got, got a, a friend from, from Denmark, Paul, who's joined us. Um, one of Paul's colleagues came to, to visit Rob's farm about four or five years ago. 
And as he left, he said, if I can ever repay the favour, let me know. And I think he's regretted it every day ever since because I asked quite a few favours of him. And, and today is a testament of that. Paul, we're very glad to have you with us to really kind of bring in a bit of a, um, a Danish perspective. Paul's a crop specialist um, for Seges in, in, in Denmark. And, and kind of they're going through similar, similar trials and tribulations in this topic that we are. And um, he'll be bringing their perspective. He won't have all the answers. Nobody does. But he'll be talking about what they're doing and, and how they're going, going over over there. Next slide, please, Christian. So like I said earlier, the hand handouts are on the side. You've got the, the kind of crucial one at the moment is the strategic farm um, week, the strategic farm reports. These are summarising all of the, the trials which are going on on both um, the strategic farms on the east and the west. Obviously, the Scottish farms just come to the end of its um, first year, which is all kind of baselining and measuring and kind of drawing a line in the stand, sand that way. So, so next year, they'll, they'll be having one of these reports of their own. Um, so these these reports are really kind of quite crucial to kind of us communicating communicating um, the results from, from all of the, the strategic farms. Next slide, please, Christian. So the session objective for today, um, this, this, this session, this seminar is a bit of an anomaly because, because all the others are reporting on results that have happened. And we're, we're almost kind of, we're, we're, we're today, we're looking at what, what do we know already to help steer how we will tackle and target and um, approach this trial. Um, and we'll come on to the detail, the detail a bit later. And it's really hoping to, to kind of help Rob um, have a bit of a direction and where he's going with it. And at the same time, yourselves can learn about kind of what we know already and, and where we're planning to go, not just in our trial, but for, for your own businesses and beyond. So next slide, please, Christian. Um, black grass. It's, I've been in this role for a few years now, and it's been a topic of conversation since, since the word go. And it's a continuing threat for 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 UK farming. Um, it's it's kind of it's you can do, I was looking doing some googling earlier of all the all the kind of facts and figures of kind of of how much of the UK's arable land it covers, and it's just astounding. And and it's and, and now we've also got the the issues of um, of black grass resistance um, that um, resistant black grass that which kind of comes into the equation makes it quite a difficult difficult um, weed to manage. So understanding it and and managing it is really kind of a priority for, for many farmers. And Rob Fox, the Strategic Farmer of the West, is one of those farmers. Rob, you kindly agreed um, that, to, that today you're just going to run us through kind of your journey um, before, um, before we kind of, before we draw mm -hmm. the line, before here today. Um, Rob was a monitor farmer before he was a strategic farmer. So um, as well as doing his own things on, off his own bat, he's been doing a few things under the monitor farm program as well. And Rob, I think I'm going to hand over to you at this stage just to take us to kind of what does black grass mean to you and why we're here. Thanks, Richard. Um, thanks for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Welcome. Welcome to uh, the second webinar of this week's uh, Strategic Farm Week. Hopefully, you'll be um, looking at the others through the week as well and um, having a look on everything else that we're trying to get out there and uh, trying to help um, you and us. Uh, and everyone else um, to farm a bit um, a bit better. Um, so yeah, my uh, my journey, my relationship with black grass, if you want to call it, um, over the years really. So we'll go back. We all know that things have changed in terms of how we control uh, difficult weeds, whether it be black grass or anything else, over the years. Um, and for us, um, you know, this began back when we were a monitor farmer five, six, seven years ago. Um, and we had to change the way we grew uh, the wheat and oilseed rape and, 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 and potentially barley as well that we grow here and the beans. Um, and look at things a bit differently just to try and, and battle one, um, uh, one particular weed. So uh, we've been doing lots of things over the years and it brings us to the point now where we've lost actives we've lost efficacy and things like that which we'll go through and now it brings up the threat of potentially losing one of the biggest things in our armory which of course um, is glyphosate near miss um, a couple of years ago um, was reapproved for five years and we don't know what's going to happen at the end of that now let's go back um, five six seven years ago we were um, we had a hell of a lot of black grass on farm we were growing um, usual sort of bog standard rotation for this part of the world, heavy 
heavy sort of medium to heavy Warwickshire clays. Uh, we were growing uh, wheat um, and then a lot of second wheats, uh, also grape, uh, spring beans. Um, we were we were losing efficacy in things like Atlantis. We've got highly resistant blackgrass here, so Atlantis um, and, that, and, and 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 those sort of things do very little for us now. Um, and with nothing else to control it, uh, we had to look at other um, other ways, other means of managing the crops um, in order to try and get the best control of that grass weed and other weeds um, that we could. So uh, slide there sort of indicates what we've been doing you know nothing nothing out there a lot of farmers have been have been nudged into into doing many or all of these things um to try and um to try and uh, out compete to try and um and get round black grass issues we've we've upped um we've upped our seed rates uh we're finding we we need a competitive crop in the ground um so we've up the seed rates we were we were sorted down to the low 300s when i began here years ago uh, we slowly upped them over time um and we're now up well into the sort of 400 plus um seeds for uh for winter wheat we find that if we can get a competitive crop in there um then that's our first step into into battling against um against any weed um competitive varieties we've certainly seen more through luck than judgment really um certain varieties being able to um out compete weeds in the in the past a particular variety that stands out in mind that is kind of out of date now and no one um we don't grow a lot of it anymore was santiago um uh, really really competitive variety and at those sort of um seed rates um could have a quite a quite a large impact on a high black grass uh, situation um, in some of our worst fields. And one was it was highlighted one year, um, a simple little thing, blockage in the drill um, on one particularly bad field, uh, a nice wide row every six meters, thankfully, um, um, uh, which meant we could really see the black grass that was able to uh, to do really well in those bare strips. Um, and what that variety was was actually adding to the control of um or helping us with the control of that of that grass weed uh variable seed rates so as well as as well as lifting the seed rates on an average over the whole field um through various types of mapping and gps systems that we've all we've all sort of got used to over the last um five years and more um we're able to um, up the seed rates automatically on certain areas. We all we all know a fair bit about this now. So not not only because we're up in the seed rates on the on the heavier land because of lower germination anyway, but then we're also able to up the seed rates where we know the black grass is um, is very bad, um, and that can and that can help us to um, outcompete um, the crop. Um, cropping. Um, Big move into spring cropping here over the last um, probably six years. We used to grow we used to grow spring beans in the rotation anyway, but now, as with a lot of people, uh, second wheats have gone out the window because we just can't we just can't do anything about a seed bank in a second wheat. Um, and then uh, if that's which was usually then going back into an oilseed rape um, level of black grass. The return of seed from the black grass from the first wheat and then into the second wheat and beyond um, was just completely outrunning us and we and, and and there was very little we could do about it so drop second wheats completely and uh, we'd usually swap those for a spring barley that gives us an extra extra opportunity or two to spray off before um before we get the spring barley um before we get the spring barley established and actually it's probably the biggest tool in our armory for getting back getting the black grass levels back down to to sort of where they are now which isn't completely eliminated um but certainly our, um where we've had um small patches in the past um we're getting those completely gone and, and, and where we've had very very dirty fields with certainly being able to put those back into a um uh into a decent winter wheat so we've also been in a situation where we've spring cropped particularly bad fields two three more years 
um, on the trot. Uh, one particular field had three spring barleys and the spring beans before we were happy to put that back into a, um, into a, win a winter wheat situation. Um, plowing and direct drilling, both ends of the scale, really. We don't do a lot of plowing here. We haven't done, um, we haven't done for quite some years, other than if there's been a block where we think the black grass has got so bad that um, running the plow through it would have a, um, 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 would reduce the seed bank um, to a level that's more manageable. It certainly doesn't eliminate it in one year. It's not the be all and end all. It's not the silver bullet. And it's also a practice that a lot of farmers on a lot of soils want to try and move away from uh, for various different reasons. Um, so it's not something we do routinely, but we've still got a plough in the nettles as a lot of farms have, and in particularly bad situations, uh, when it's the right thing to do, we, we certainly wouldn't rule out um, bringing it out and burying, um, trying to bury some of that seed bank. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Direct drilling, something we sort of messed around with a little bit here over the years, um, not on any great scale. It's something I'm interested in, but I'm struggling. I'm probably struggling to do it correctly, I think is the, is the, is the right way to put it. Um, not saying it can't be done, just saying I'm not doing it right at the moment. Um, I've got a slide in a minute uh, that, we'll sh that we'll see, um, which actually does show one of the huge benefits of reducing the 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 seed bank, the seed return um, in a winter raw seed rate crop. Uh, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, cleaning machinery, we, we farm with two other local farmers on a joint venture and um, we've all got different levels of black grass. So we are um, trying to do our best hydro rain round with the, with the harvester and that gets a good blow down before it moves um, from dirty fields into into blocks which have got less grass in them in the first place. So we're, we're, we're trying to stop moving it around our, ourselves um, with, with our equipment. Everyone thinks of harvesters and balers. And yes, they do. Um, uh, they are responsible for that a lot. Um, but actually one of the highest uh, and one of the worst areas I've seen for spreading it around is underneath the sprayer. Um, if you're desiccating a, a winter wheat crop, um, the black grass is just at that right time that it doesn't take a lot to knock it out. And then you look at all the flat surfaces underneath your sprayer at the end of it, and they sit there just an inch thick in black grass seed. So that was a real eye opener for um, uh, for me, not just looking at the harvest machinery, but also everything else as well. Dirty machinery, so um, anything that engages with the soil, you know, wet conditions, it's sticking all over these machines. You're getting black grass all in these big clods that are sticking to machines. And then you go to a nice clean block the next day uh, and run that machine in there. And then you wonder why there's a streak of black grass um, up the field the following year. So we're trying to be, um, uh, we're trying to be more vigilant with ourselves on, on that side of things as well. We're trying um, weed mapping uh, and, and not so much variable spraying, but sort of on and off automatic spot spraying. Again, the technology is there now, creating the maps of your worst areas, um, and whether it be spraying off or going back with a, um, a second herbicide uh, in the autumn or whatever it may be, um, to try and just, just add a bit more control into these, into these dirty areas. We can, we can map them, we can upload them onto the, um, um, onto the computer in the office and then send that back out to the um, machinery and, and, and it can do it automatically. So you don't have to be looking over the crop thinking, oh, I've got to switch that section on and then that section off and then that section on. It'll do it, you know, it'll do it all of its, all itself. Uh, we've mentioned diminishing chemistry. With, we, uh, as an industry, we're under pressure. We're losing lots of actives, not just herbicides, not just against blackgrass, lots of actives. Um, all throughout, and we've got to find ways, novel ways, different ways, um, or bring older ways back in um, of handling a lot of the um, diseases, weeds, and everything else that's thrown at us um, uh, with the lack of um, any new any new sprays coming into our armory. Um, herbicide resistance we've mentioned with with um, 
at, at Lantis and other pre-emergence chemicals as well being less effective than, than, than they used to be with very few options coming, um, coming to the market. Um, which kind of steers us up to date, really. One of the biggest things uh, we were using was a glyphosate spray pre-drilling. Uh, once we'd got the seedbed ready, um, maybe a fortnight before we were hoping to drill, uh, we'd make sure we get that um, undisturbed for a fortnight. Let's uh, let it get a flush of black grass and then try and try and spray that off um, pre-drilling. Um, and that brings us on to this year's trial. Richard, did you want to say something? No. Um, can I? Yeah, can I? Because I interrupt with a couple of questions there. Robert. Yeah. Um, a couple of come in and kind of. Uh, you, you mentioned that you're you you feel that you're at a manageable level now. How do you manage those levels? And kind of some the person asking said they kind of um, you hear about things like traffic light kind of um, ways of managing it. And what is a good good manageable level to you? Well, good manageable level would be nothing at all. But I don't think we're ever. Well, I don't think. I don't think we're going to be there in a long time. We're not even close to getting to rogable levels yet. We are we are sort of holding it back a bit with spring cropping. We're holding it back with um, not having anything like second wheat in there anymore, um, and, and and it's not it's not getting any worse for us at the moment. Um, we do seem to have good years and bad years, obviously depending on the weather. Um, so manageable, manageable levels. I think it would be lovely to get down to roguing a couple of fields. Unfortunately, it's much more widespread for us, um, much more widespread for us at the moment still. So whether we'll get there in time or whether it's something we're always going to have to try and manage within the crop over the years. The, there's a lot of kind of basic good farming principles that help with black glass management and drainage is is one of them being on such a wet farm do you do you see where you, when you've kind of maintained the drain drainage system that kind of it has it has a has it help on, on the black grass management yeah of course of course it does that's a you know it's a it's a no-brainer we, we've uh we are we are on um we have got some very very wet fields that have good drainage in them and they're still you know they still flood when it's when it's horrifically wet the thing about some of these heavy clays is even when the drains are in good nick underneath them getting the water through to that drain can be a very slow um, um, slow process so um, getting that top six inches in good condition as well so the water can get through and then you know and get down a foot and a half uh, uh, down to those drains um, is equally as important. And if you don't do much ploughing or direct drilling, what method, can you just clarify what method of, of um, establishment you do use? Yeah, so it's sort of a um, pretty standard non-inversion, one pass disc tine cultivator, which could potentially be one of our worst enemies in all this, um, mixing the seed through the profile. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at a quick slide in a minute um, on the benefits of direct drilling but um yeah that's our farm standard at the moment but for different reasons um not not purely for the grass weed control but you know we've got to we've got to get a seed bed we've got to get the winter water away from new seed and that's and that's why we do um that's why we do what we do to try and establish a, a competitive crop have you done anything with your row spacings to kind of to see the impact of that on um inherited a horse drill when i came here so we were we were we've always been on band on band sewing so originally a, a seven inch band um we've since moved down to a five inch band not because of crop competition purely because it's a better low draft foot so um that's kind of a different a different reason but i am um i, I would worry about going to wider row spacing some people are probably probably doing it and making it work and that's great from my from my point of view, I'd worried about going to narrower, wider space rows. Like I say, it's crop competition; it's blocking out light down to the soil surface, intercepting that light, um, which helps us, I believe, helps us out compete where we can get a um, where we can get a thick crop established. Obviously, everything on that list is kind of 
it's bringing a lot of things together and a lot of kind of mm. tinkering and, and getting the right thing. Is there anything on it that you'd say is kind of a no brainer that you've kind of, you've had that light bulb moment, like, oh, I should have been doing this for a long time. Is it kind of, is there anything with your black glass kind of management, is there anything you think I should have done that all along? Uh, dropping second weights. Uh, we should have done years earlier. Um, you know, you come out of a, of a winter wheat crop um, with black grass in it, that's that seed. And what you do, you go straight back into another winter wheat crop where it's, it, it's difficult to control. So coming away from, from a, um, a second wheat into a, into a spring barley um, has had the biggest hit on, 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 on black grass levels here. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And having had so much spring barley in this last year and then well the spring crops in this last um harvest year harvest 20 have you seen has it had the the impact which they kind of which is kind of proclaimed to do well it's it's I, sp I suppose it's one upside of a horrifically wet winter here um we we planted in the autumn we planted 25 acres of winter wheat of the usual 600 um across the three farms and then we managed to get another couple of hundred ac um, acres in 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 February, but it did mean that we had a hell of a lot of spring barley, um, which caused its own headaches. But the one upside is, you know, a lot of land um, had an extra spray or more. Um, I'd like to say um, before we went into a spring barley or a spring bean crop. So, um, so yeah, so it was it was one good thing to come out of just an absolutely abhorrent winter. Um, so it's not all. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom. It's just a, a little bit, a little bit doom. Not so much gloom. Um, yeah. Awesome, awesome so, and that, and that sort of uh, brings us. If we can flick on um, one slide, please, Christian. Um, so we, we're trying to get ourselves into a mindset of not what do we do with the black grass when it's there. How, you know, how do we control it when it's there? What can we do before that to try and limit seed return? To try and limit um, the amount of seed going back into the ground, and this was a this was a really good example. Uh, this was an experiment we did back in in the monitor farm days when we direct drilled some um, oilseed rape, and um, we we didn't carry out this trial because we wanted to see what would happen with the seed bank of of grass weeds. It was I can't even remember why. I think it was just investigating whether we could establish an oilseed rape crop with direct drill um, so hopefully you can see um, the two black lines either side and the green to the to the right and the left of those of those black lines that's black grass um, in the crop and the bit down the middle um, is where we direct drilled the oilseed rape and the, we had such less return of black grass seed into the crop because we had less germinate in the crop, if that makes sense. So it was kind of a, a knock-on effect. Now, sadly, the um, oil seed rape that we direct drilled was a complete disaster. So um, although we were getting we were getting benefits on 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 one hand, um, it wasn't quite working. Um, it wasn't quite working for the crop itself. But it shows how we could, we should be thinking way 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 before the, the the weed is there to control. What can we do to try and stop it being there in the in the first place if we can flick on a slide please christian um so brings us to the current um concern if we were if we were to lose uh, more actives in particular glyphosate can we create a stale seedbed without chemical application obviously um uh, the organic boys have been doing this for a, for, a, for a long long time obviously very very different situation in the in the in the long run but what are the alternative options to us um, obviously we have to go down the mechanical route um, we um, we didn't plow in this trial we, we, we I took the decision not to do that this was more about getting the, the, the weed and it's not just black grass in this situation volunteer cereals broadleaf weeds getting them to germinate and then trying to um, take them out before we uh, before we drill by moving the ground, just moving that top two inches. Different methods of cultivation um, uh, to to try and get rid of those before we establish crop. 
Um, and what would the, the knock-on effects of this be? Yes, we'd be using less glyphosate, but we'd be burning more diesel, um, more man hours, more machine hours, um, you know, more emissions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's what we want to try and look at over time. Probably worth very briefly um, saying that we did try this, or there was a plan to have this trial in the ground um, last year as well, but obviously because of the poor winter, um, we, 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 we just had to write it off. We couldn't, we couldn't get on to, uh, um, to work the ground anyway. It was that wet um, and we didn't get a crop drilled into it anyway and had to go into a spring barley. So last year, unfortunately, didn't have any results this year. This year we are we are there. We've got all the plots established. There's a winter wheat crop gone into it because of the the, 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 the mess around with cropping up off the back of the wet winter. It was a it's come out in spring barley and gone into winter wheat, which causes us our own headaches um, or its own headaches. In that we've got the black grass isn't really our problem this year. It's a mass of volunteer spring barley inside um, uh, in the winter wheat crop. And if we just flick on one slide quickly i won't say too much more about the trial but this is a recent ndvi of the um of the field itself the yellower areas in there are a higher green area and the yellower areas are the areas that we haven't sprayed off instead we've um uh, before we drilled instead we've worked those with various different machines um to try and um to try and eliminate the volunteers and the and the black grass but they are um we're already noticing now that we, they are absolutely thick with uh, volunteer spring barley. So that's that kind of brings us up to date with everything that we've um, had to try over the years and, and now things that we're potentially keeping our eye on if we are to lose other actives, uh, have to change something about how we establish our crops um, again in the, in the future. So back to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, well, with all the questions you did, you did turn and touch on it slightly there, but I'm going to ask it just to, just in case. Kind of, is what what do you think we can be learning from from organic systems here? What 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 have you seen in your on your travels that that you thought ah that could work for me? Um, what, I mean, they look at it in a completely different way because they're they're. They're not only looking pre-drilling; they're they're looking at what they're going to do in the crop as well. So, um, I think I think arable, I think conventional arable will adopt more and more uh, intercrop hoeing going forward um, where we can. Um, that means getting onto the ground at the right time, which can be difficult for us being so wet. It means um, that would be a situation where you'd want to widen the rows um, of a wheat crop in particular so you can get a hoe into it. Um, um, but yeah, I think I think in um, intercrop, in crop hoeing um, is, is probably one of the things we're going to take forward. I mean, in a, in a usual year, I wouldn't be growing winter wheat after spring barley. It's not something we usually do. We've just been sort of nudged into that this year because of a very bad year um, last year. Perfect. Thank you, Rob. So I'm going to segue straight into to Sarah Cook. Sarah's going to pick up the reins here and really kind of just explain to us about the, the trial going on at the Strategic Farm, Farm West. And she's been advising on how we approach it and, and, and how, how we look at it. And also kind of so that you guys can take something kind of home from this is kind of what assumptions we'd be looking at to make um, from, from, from prior work and prior research. Sarah, without further, any further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everybody. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is the, the field itself, and you can see how we've laid out the trial. It's a, a tramline trial, and we've got uh, four replicates. You can see the treatments here in their different colours, and you can see how it's laid out. Um, so let's look at the field itself, because the, the soil uh, and the sort of aspect of the field is a quite a key point in, in weeds. And as we all know in fields, we have weeds in specific places. So can we have the next slide, please? As you can see, we've got quite a variation in soil type here, um, quite large areas of different lighter and heavier soil types. And, and this, when you see the results later of some of the weed populations, this comes into play. Um, can I have the next slide, please? 
So here, here we've got the uh, treatments overlaid. Now it's always difficult with these tramline trials to, to get a consistent um, view of the population and, and give each treatment a fair go. But with the four replications, we go over, carry over all of the, the soil types. And now I'm going to go on to um, explain the treatments that we had with some, oh, some of the treatments and the weed uh, levels pre-treatment. So next slide, please. So we went over there on the 18th of September, the day that the cultivations were done. Um, luckily, there was only a little black grass. So uh, at the minute, the black grass hadn't germinated or we'd had a flush and it, it disappeared. Um, we've got black grass only found on the headline of the tramline nearest the road with 40, 41 plants, but not in any of the tramline treatments. The main reason for this, I think, was the vast number of spring volley volunteers obviously competing the black grass out, not letting it germinate, maybe changing the um, temperature and moisture content of the soil surface, reducing light so the black grass is not germinating. So quite high populations, as Rob mentioned, with spring volley volunteers. But we've also got the odd cleaver, charlock and groundsel. So that day the cultivations were done. And then the Two of the cultivations, the springtime and the Vadastad, which we didn't put the glyphosate on, were repeated again on the 30th September, and the trial was drilled on the 1st of October. So next slide, please. So this is treatment one. So this is the farm standard, power harrow and glyphosate. So it was power harrowed with glyphosate on the 18th of September. The depths of cultivation range from three to eight centimeters, so quite shallow. So keeping uh, the seed in that top layer of the, the seed bed where we want it to germinate from. A good tilth, as you can always see from a power harrow, and it looks quite dusty there, quite dry, but kicking up some dust. So giving us a good tilth and a small crumb size. And uh, all the spring volunteers were, were quite well destroyed, all hoiked out of the soil and left on the surface to dry. And you can see on the right there, the size of the crumb. So next slide, please. This is treatment two, just a simple spring time with a duck foot um, with no glyphosate. So the, this treatment was done twice. This one, you can see pictures here are from the first of cultivation. You can see the high number of spring barley volunteers in the picture. Um, the depth is about four to seven centimetres, still, so still keeping it shallow, keeping that um, cultivation zone cultivated and not bringing up any um, mysteries from the, from the deep and high populations, which could probably are in the seed bank. They tended to leave the soil in mini ridges, and I think on the right hand side you can see this, where we've got a mini ridge of soil um, through the, the springtime cultivation. And it didn't manage to remove all of the spring barley volunteers. It left them in clumps and some were still able to um, survive. Next slide, please. The third treatment is a Vardastat Culti Quattro with no glyphosate. This was again done on the 18th and 30th of September. The depth ran mostly at four to eight centimetres. So, but up to 10 centimetres in the lightest soils at the bottom of the field and only two centimetres deep in the deeper, um, heavier soils at the top of the field. So as you can see, we're bringing, beginning to introduce problems here with cultivations alone, variable depths of cultivation varying with soil type. And, and they can see from the quality of the, the seed bed there, we've got the larger clod size, and we've got surviving spring barley volunteers. The soil tilth was better than treatment too, than the springtime, so better than springtime, but still leaving those larger clumps, up to 15 to 25 centimetres in size in the, the heavier soil. Spring barley removal was better than treatment too, but it still left a lot of spring barley volunteers intact. And with no glyphosate, it's difficult for them to be controlled. So next slide, please. So we went in again uh, on the 26th of October. So this is after drilling. 
with a, a weed count. The crop was at gross T12 to 13 and there was good establishment across all of the treatments. The cleavers were found in quite high amounts in certain areas of the field and you can see there the uh, on the right hand side by the road we got 52, 57, 18 and that's the shallow soil over sandstone and then in the, the soil at the bottom of the field where they've got the high numbers it's in the medium low um, soil. We found other brassicas at lower numbers and then we move on to the next slide and we can see how much black grass there was. So there wasn't a lot of black grass but there's still um, chance for it to emerge. Temperature is still warm, we've got a lot of rainfall, lots of moisture and um, black grass is likely still to emerge if it's present although we did keep the cultivation shallow. Um, next slide please. So how do we cultivate, how do we create a stale seed bed without glyphosate? I mean it, it's, it's difficult, it's very very difficult. So we've got things we can manage and things we can't manage. Things we can't manage are weather conditions, we just have to work around them. Um, weather conditions affect drying, so where you do cultivations you haven't got any glyphosate, you're looking for drying conditions and you're looking to take those um, weeds out of their soil cloth so their roots are exposed. If you move wet clods of weeds around, black grass is very good at surviving, wheat isn't so good at surviving and black grass will just reroot. And then temperature, weed germination. So as temperatures remain high, uh, weeds will continue to germinate. If temperatures drop, then black grass germination will fall away. And we've had a tend tendency in the last few autumns to, to get warmer autumns and, and this autumn is no no different to those where we've got temperatures of what 15 16 degrees today so black grass is quite happy to germinate and grow well the things we can manage starting in the right place i think robert's mentioned this you've got to start in the right place with a low population and seed bank of black grass so you we have to strive now while we still have glyphosate I'm not saying that we're going to lose it but while we still have it is to get black grass populations down so starting from the right place, the low populations. You've also got to allow an adequate window opportunity to cultivate between harvest and drilling. As Rob mentioned, he's had most success in controlling blackgrass where he's grown spring crops. And that is the ultimate wide window. So we've got a pre-harvest in the autumn, plenty of time to cultivate. And this is what we will need if we don't have glyphosate. We will have to go in, in good drying windows of opportunity to cultivate to kill that black grass before we drill the crop. So timing cultivation, that refers back to the weather. We want to do it on drying days. When the soil is drying, we can get good crumbs and take those black grass out of the clods. And then a choice of machinery. We've got to have a choice of machinery, alternatives and depth of working. So how are we going to kill those um, weeds? Where are they germinating from? The, uh, the, the weed is at its weakest as it just starts to emerge from the seed and we call it that the white um, thread stage. So taking it out then when you can't even see it above there, you're taking it out and you're beginning to, you're killing it while you can't see it. Next please. So the thing is to keep ahead of the weeds. You've got to go in while the weeds are small. You've got to go in while they're vulnerable in a vulnerable period. It's no use waiting until they're big and tillering. They're much harder to, to kill. So keeping ahead of the weeds is key. So this is a, a slide here from the glyphosate project, the AHDB glyphosate project. And it shows you the value of an autumn cultivation. So even where we've used no glyphosate, autumn glyphosate or spring glyphosate, you can see that where we've done a, a, an aut a November cultivation, we have much lower levels of black grass in, in the spring. And this was shown throughout this experiment. We did a wide range of experiments, both in winter crops and spring crops. You get a better effect where you've got spring cultivation spring crops this is this trial is before a spring barley where we have november cultivation so autumn cultivations are much more valuable 
And I think that's me done. Any questions? I've got a couple coming in here, Sarah. Uh, one was around um, um, cover crops. I think this person might have um, attended the, the session this morning. Um, but we mentioned uh, this earlier today in a cover crop session that kind of a reason for using a cover crop could be weed suppression. What are your thoughts and your experiences in, in it being an effective approach? Cover crops definitely suppress weeds. They alter the atmosphere and the, the sort of conditions at the surface of the soil. So and they discourage so, uh, other seeds from germinating. So if they get ahead, they will discourage them from germinating. We, we don't have a lot of information on what happens to those seeds. So are they waiting for an opportunity to germinate? Um, cover crops also will bring in more um, predators uh, to eat seeds. They may create more fungi are able to grow. So you may lose more seeds on the surface. But I, I think more work needs to be done on cover crops. I think they do suppress weeds, they do compete against them, but then a good crop will compete against uh, black grass. So a, a competitive crop is probably the key thing here. But more work to be done on cover crops and weeds. You mentioned there kind of there's more work to be done on that other where obviously the research moves to where the there's there's a kind of a lesser understanding and there's more to find out where in 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 the the kind of sphere of weeds are are we heading towards where is there kind of what's the next steps for where we're we looking into oh, weed research um trying to make herbicides work better that's one of the areas we're looking at um competition so looking at ipm strategies against weeds and hopefully bringing in some cover crop work so using a cover crop but often a cover crop can turn into a weed so if you can't get rid of it you've got that competition against your crop already so killing getting rid of that cover crop is key and if we lose glyphosate we will have a a, a problem although we have done a little bit of work on getting rid of cover crops without glyphosate there's, there's no silver bullet for any of this, is there? It's kind of a real integrated approach. No, it's going to be even harder. It's not going to be easier. It's going to be even harder. You've really got to think about rotations. You've really got to think about crops. You've really got to think about drilling dates and it, it, life will get very difficult. Thank you, Sarah. I've got a few other questions coming in, but I think I'm going to save them for, for the end. Um, I think we've got a poll now, Christian, if I, if I remember correctly. Before we go on to Paul, so the poll is question is, which of the black grass control trial approaches do you think will have the best impact on black, on Rob's black grass management? And that's this is based on your own knowledge and experience and and what you've gone through on your own businesses and what you've gone through in your own farming careers. Um, if you choose, those are the three different approaches that Rob is taking um, with his trial. From your own experiences, what would you say is going to have the, the most impact on his black grass population? So you've got power harrow and glyphosate, which is the farm standard right now. Um, you've got a duck foot and spring tine with no glyphosate and um, a Vastad Colti Quattro with no glyphosate. Obviously, we've seen seen um, where where the populations are at now as a, as a result, but at the end of the day. So we get five more seconds. Okay, th thanks, Christian. There you go, Rob. Rob, have you got any comments on that before I move on to Paul? Um, I, I, I think it's quite obvious that most of us would presume that um, spraying the, the black grass out before we drill is going to have the, the, the biggest impact going forward. Um, it will be very interesting if there's any difference between the two non-glyphosate methods going through the season, and that's what and that's what we're really that's what we're really interested in um, and see if anything um, is obvious through those. Perfect. Thank you, Rob. Um, Christian, we move on to the to the opener slide for, for Paul. And I'm going to hand over to, to Paul. Um, Paul, if you turn your, your camera on a moment. And there we go. Here we are. I just wanted to see I could see you just so you're there. Definitely. But um, Paul, 
thank you very much for joining us. I said it earlier, it's kind of calling in a favour from, from your colleague and um, he came with a high recommendation um, from, from, for you. Um, is kind of, I suppose you spend a lot of your time, time talking about weed management as well. A lot of the things that you just saw there with Sarah, is that what you'd, you'd be seeing in Denmark as well as kind of good practice? Sure. And uh, we are also working with uh, integrated weeds management and, and also have some demo farms uh, like you have. And it's exactly the same ideas we are working with. Before, before I hand over to you formally, what, what's your, your biggest barrier to, to, black, to, to, to weed management in, in Denmark? Is it farmers' attitudes and kind of and, and adhering to all these things that we've just been talking about? Or is it the wider, the chemicals being taken away from us and, and, and not no longer available? What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's about what is coming first, because we also have a lack of uh, actives which are efficient. Uh, for back grass and in Denmark we have, have a lot of uh, Italian rye grass and um, many of these populations are uh, uh, re resistant like uh, in UK and, and therefore uh, we now have a lack of actives and I think our uh, job as advisors are to convince the farmers that they have to to change their crop rotation and all this uh, integrated uh, wheat management stuff uh, as early as possible. Just as uh, Rob said about uh, the second year uh, winter uh, wheat, uh, do it at once. <laughs> no brainer. Okay, no brainer. Well, without, without further ado, I'll, I'll kind of hand over to you and I'll, and I'll stay quiet. Okay. Thank you for talking to you this afternoon and uh, I hope you will understand my Danish English. Uh, first, uh, I will say a few words about the situation in Denmark about uh, pesticides. Uh, and if I can have the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> a few words about the public uh, opinion uh, about pesticides. Uh, I think the Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Denmark, they are comfortable with the situation about pesticide. I think they uh, have much concern, but uh, in the uh, public uh, opinion, there are some hardliners, uh, some uh, professors and so on, who are uh, very concerned and uh, because of that, uh, in the newspapers, in the uh, social media and so on, uh, we talk a, a lot about uh, organic farming. Uh, that's the, the final uh, uh, goal to, to reach. Um, and we talk a lot of uh, less use of pesticides or even no pesticides. And of course, in Denmark, we also talk about no glyphosate if uh, it will not be renewed in, in within the next two years. Uh, we think uh, it will have very, very hard consequences. And, and in SIGIS and, and in the uh, uh, Farmers Association, uh, we try to uh, take steps uh, uh, to avoid uh, that uh, this will happen. Uh, so we, we, we hope to convince our politicians that they have to support the stay of uh, glyphosate on the market. Uh, our Danish e uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, it is uh, very uh, scientific based <clears throat> and, and so, so they uh, support that the glyphosate should uh, stay on market. And uh, up to now, the Danish government and parliament also support that uh, assessment. Uh, but, uh, but, but you never know about uh, the, the political situation, as we saw in France and, and, and uh, Austria and, and some other places in, in Europe. And next slide, please. <clears throat> um, 
the subject for this afternoon is uh, plant production without pesticides or at least fewer pesticides. And, and here in Denmark, uh, we have um, uh, pesticides are banded in many water protection areas. Uh, but we can see that farmers, they still rent this land owned by the public. And um, what we see is that they don't manage this land uh, in a good way. They have a very short uh, horizon and, and uh, the way they are doing is not uh, sustainable. So, so we can learn something from that. Um, and we also see that you no know, uh, of the real professional farmers, they, they don't want to, to manage these uh, kind of areas. So um, the next slide, please. Um, here I show a, a picture from such a field uh, where they have grown cereals for about 10 years without pesticides. And it's obviously that that, that isn't possible just to continue growing uh, conventionally uh, without uh, herbicides. And the next please. And here I have um, one of the big problem when you are uh, growing uh, crops without herbicides. That's the perennial wheat here, Canada thistle. And uh, this uh, wheat is very serious problem for our organic farmers in, in Denmark. And, and if we lose too many actives, I'm sure that it will also be a problem in, in conventionally uh, uh, grown crops. And the, and the next, um, in Denmark, we had a, a, a scientific report 20 years ago, ago. It's quite a long time, but uh, I think the, the, the scientific uh, conclusions are the same, they are the same today. Uh, and these this, uh, reports said that it will not be possible to grow uh, crops without uh, pesticides. And at that time we had in Denmark five year trials without any uh, pesticides. And as you see here on the pictures, uh, there are a lot of Canada systems. Uh, these areas are plowed, but no herbicides. Uh, but where, where you have plowed and used herbicides, there are no Canada systems. And that's even that on this area, the, the systems was hand weeded the first two years, and after that, they were done heavy harrowing every autumn. And the next. I have made this uh, uh, graph. Uh, it's um, it's the, the organic farming area from 2012 to 19. And um, if, if the, the, the upper curve, the brown one, that's the potential organic farming area. If all converted areas stayed organic, um, but every year some organic farmer they uh, go back to conventional farming, and um, that's why the green one is the realized organic farming area in Denmark. And a lot of the reason, one of the reasons, is that uh, these farmers get problems with uh, perennial weeds like Canada thistles, and, um, and they don't change their crop rotation early enough to avoid. In Denmark, we, uh, we think that uh, an organic farmer has to have uh, two years of crow grass within six years of uh, rotation to uh, control the perennial weeds. The next, please. 
Uh, and now uh, some some words about uh, Climset. Uh, as I said, uh, we are uh, worried and uh, we are doing some work at Sigis to find ways to grow our crops with this or no Climset like you are doing, uh, but so far without any really uh, good ideas. And uh, the Danish Agriculture and Food Council, Council uh, who are owners of SIGIS, they are working on a voluntary initiative to reduce the use of uh, glyphosate. Uh, we have no decision yet, but the idea is that we have to show that we, we, can, we can only use glyphosate when needed and not use it just for it's, it's nice to use. Uh, the next please. And, and we have uh, also made some field trials this autumn, and uh, we had uh, we we have um, used gloves at pre-serving as normally, then used a disc herring uh, three times, and then a straw herring, a, a, a tiny one, and and uh, then. Uh, we have shown uh, winter series, and I think it's it's uh, visible on the on the photo that uh, the discoloring three times is uh, quite as good as gloves at pre -serum. But it must be said that this autumn it was very dry, so that means that all the volunteers and uh, weeds they have. Uh, tilted uh, very easily. And the, the next one. Um, here I have shown uh, the, the, the use of Clavset in, in, in Denmark and uh, the, the use of Clavset have increased uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot during the, the last 15, 20 years. Uh, so, so we know that, that the politicians, they, they concern about the, the size of the, the consumption. Uh, we have uh, used our data from Danish farms and, and, and uh, have found that pre-harvest uh, cereals <clears throat> uh, is the most important use of plastic. And that's for control of uh, weeds. Uh, the, the perennials, but also uh, for easing, uh, to make the, the harvest easier, uh, more dry, dry uh, grain and, and more dry straw, uh, so it's easier to collect. Uh, then uh, stubble uh, or cover crop uh, desiccation is important and also uh, uh, in the stubble uh, before sowing in, in autumn. Um, and, and we also have uh, stubble uh, during the winter time and until March as a, an important uh, use. And then uh, a lot of uh, smaller uses, uh, pre-sowing, uh, desiccation of uh, grassland uh, used for seed production or fodder production, uh, cover crops uh, sown in, in maize, uh, and, and, and so on. But uh, it's here uh, quite obvious that if we have to change the, the, the use, the pre-harvest and the use in stubble uh, to, for desiccation of uh, Tweets and 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 and, and uh, volunteers. That that's uh, the the important uh, ones. And and the next please. Um, what what we are doing now is that that we try to uh, to make uh, awareness and and doing advice to use the uh, glyph set as um, dedicated as uh, possible. Uh, 
and uh, we th also think that we in the future should have some demo farms uh, working with Glyphosate. Uh, maybe it could be a part of the three demo farms we already are running. Uh, they are running. Uh, uh, they, they are uh, doing. Uh, they are demonstrating uh, integrated uh, pest management. And then uh, we work uh, with a new technology uh, mapping of uh, perennials uh, with uh, drone photos, for example, and also use the, the spraying technology to spot spraying or variable uh, 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 doses. And, and the next one, please. <clears throat> This is in, in Danish, so uh, it's just to show that that we are trying to to get this message out in our papers. And the next one, and and the same is said here on our website. Here it's about uh, using a glyphosate to desiccate uh, cover crops in, in Denmark. Uh, cover crops like uh, radish and uh, sinapis, they will uh, disappear during the winter by themselves. So why use glyphosate uh, as many farmer does? Uh, that's, that uh, would be unnecessary in most cases. And the next one. But uh, if we are going, uh, I, I, on, the, on, the for, on the former side, I, I, I had written 10% scenario, meaning that we think that we can reduce the, the use of glyphosate by 10% by uh, awareness and, and advice and some demonstrations. If we are going to reduce by 25%, we have to do a lot more. And especially, uh, we think that we need to use new technology to uh, mapping uh, perennials. Uh, and uh, we also need to strengthen uh, the farm management. The farmer has to use a lot of time to, uh, to um, mapping weeds. Uh, and of course, that will be uh, costly. Uh, this uh, harvest, we also did some trials using um, um, ah, I, I, I forgot the name, the English uh, word for, for this, but you can see it on the picture. You are cutting the, the seals uh, three to five days before uh, harvest. And then uh, it will do the same job as uh, glyphosate, and the grain will be dry, and the straw will be dry and easy uh, to collect. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, my last uh, slide. And um, and in spite of, of the, the, the the speech from uh, Rob and uh, uh, and the the, the work he is doing. I think I will uh, uh, mention that in, in Denmark uh, we uh, work with uh, hoeing, uh, in-crop hoeing. It's quite uh, used in, in maize uh, in combination with chemical control. It's uh, also used as the last uh, treatment in sugar beets. Uh, so that means two or three uh, sprays and then uh, one uh, hoeing in sugar beet. In, in maize, it's normally one or sometimes two sprays and then uh, the last treatment is uh, hoeing. Uh, we also um, try to use hoes in, in, in seals, but the capacity is quite low, so I think it will not be used by farmers uh, as long as we have uh, any herbicides left. Yes, I think uh, that's my words for now.
thank you, Paul. I've asked, I'm going to ask Rob and um, Sarah to, to add their cameras on. Um, Christian, if you could go to the, to the next slide, please. Um, Paul, thank you very much. Not only do you deliver some some kind of some relevant and, and excellent information, you have to do it in another language, and so you've got every you've got every respect from me. Um, Rob, what did you what did you take from that? What 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 were your messages coming out from from Paul's um, Paul's uh, messages from over in Denmark? Yeah, thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, very very interesting. I think it demonstrates that we are, you know, agriculture all across Europe um, is. Um, up against the same issues um, or similar issues and we're all trying to find slightly um, slightly new ways uh, to do things the more and more actives we lose whether it is herbicides whether it's fungicides whether it's insecticides we've got to find a way um, around these problems and at the same time argue our case um, I don't think we should roll over and let these things go um, we've got to argue um, why we need them, why we think they are safe, why we think they are beneficial to, to, to farming systems, but at the same time trying to find, um, you know, slightly different ways um, around these issues. I think we'll be producing less um, uh, off the same area, um, but as long as we can carry on producing and carry on getting some sort of support for it. So Rob, first question um, for discussion for, for yourself is you, you mentioned uh, mechanical weeding and kind of the place of that and kind of how, how you'd like to, to look more into that and kind of what's the kind of, can you quantify the cost because it's, it's obviously you, you're reducing the chemicals used but you're, you're, you're traveling the ground a bit more, your, your man hours and, 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 and everything in, in, included. Have you thought about that much as well? Yeah, I mean it's the, it's the same every time something gets something gets withdrawn, isn't it? The, the, um, the, the people who get paid a lot more than we do seem to think that you can solve a problem just by getting rid of one thing, yet it means that we have to use something else in its place. You know, um, getting rid of neonics has create, created an issue where there's more insecticide use elsewhere, which in the long term is thought to be um, more detrimental. Uh, for a lot of species than, 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 than the neonics were in the first place. And what we've got here is a situation where a quick pass with a litre and a half or a few litres of glyphosate for a stale seedbed is inevitably going to be replaced with two or three passes with a, um, um, a machine mechanically. That's more, that's more hours, that's more diesel. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's more expensive for the, for the farmer. Um, it's slower uh, we're, we're, we're moving the ground more in a time where we're being encouraged to move the ground less and it just seems to go against um, what we're being asked to do elsewhere so I think um, it's really important for, for everyone involved to look at the knock-on um, of these um, of these situations and, and and what happens by losing one thing what's what's what other thing is going to be done more and more that might actually be more detrimental in the long run for for the environment, for the ground, and for and for and for other species. Sarah, on similar vein, a question um, to, for you: Does the drive to increase organic matter in soils reduce the activity or herbic of herbicides and make black grass worse? What do you think? Well, oh, a good one. I think as you increase the organic matter, the soil tends to become more fertile, and obviously, black grass is going to sort of make the most of that. Whether um, uh, so what they, it's very very difficult to increase the organic matter uh, an excessive amount so to get it up to say a, a peak, proper pixel where herbicides don't work properly I think it would take a long time to get your organic matter up to a level where herbicides don't work properly I think I think it's something worth looking at and and monitoring but in the uh, short term I don't think it's going to be a problem okay any comments um, Rob I suppose that covers, covers it. Sorry, big one. Yeah. <laughs> Put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, if growing cereals without glyphosate, will inter-row hoeing be an inevitable part of any new system? Go to you first, Paul. Do you think that kind of, if we, if we haven't got glyphosate um, going for us at all, then will inter-row hoeing be be the only the only option that we have? Um, uh, first, uh, I. I I really can't imagine a situation without glyphosate. 
because I'm fully agree with Rob that uh, it gives no uh, meaning that to to get rid of the glyphosate and use a lot of diesel and, and uh, get a lot a lot of problems. So uh, I think in the end, uh, uh, glyphosate will be will, will stay. But but anyway, if if it should happen, uh, I I think that uh, inter row intercrop hoeing is is one of the possibilities uh, because um, with the, with the equipment uh, in in Denmark we have now uh, 12 meter machines on market and they they are steering with cameras and GPS and and uh, the speed can be about <clears throat> seven eight maybe even nine kilometers per hour then 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 it will be possible but uh, of course it will be uh, expensive uh, the investment uh, and uh, it will consume a lot of uh, time for the farmer and uh, we will spend a lot of uh, diesel and, and the emission will be uh, a lot bigger rob Paul, Paul mentioned at the end of his presentation, kind of the the advent of new technology, and you're quite an I'd I'd like to say you, I'd like to you'd think that you're quite an early adopter of technology, and you like trying new things, and you're you're quite progressive with with your approach to technology. What kind of place do you see technology having in in terms of weed management for your future? Uh, it's a good it's a good question. There's a lot of stuff already out there now. Where is it going to go from here? I guess. Um, there's a lot of people looking down the robotic line, whether we can farm on a smaller scale mechanically, so we can we can pay more attention to meter by meter and get rid of um, and get rid of weeds on on that basis. Working, you know, slightly smaller robots can work all night. They can work through the through the night, and therefore when we um, you know those unproductive hours that we we can't physically work 24 hours a day they can so the fact that they're smaller um it shouldn't have too much of a detriment so i think i think long term it will be you know it will be robotics whether it's the robotic application of sprays or whether it's a robotic mechanical weeding um in crop where we can pay more attention to the surviving crop um i think i think that's where a lot of it is going now and another one for, for you, Rob, was kind of is, is using using herbicides as a low carbon method method of controlling weeds. Should that be a factor in deciding what method to use? And can obviously we're chatting about it this morning, kind of the, the carbon release from cultivating the soil, something to bring in into that into this whole kind of discussion. What what are your thoughts? I, I think you've got to talk about and consider every single angle, you know. You, you, you you've got to talk about um, what it does from a financial point of view of, of, of the farmer. So it's a very cheap, effective way for us to um, eliminate weeds before we drill. Uh, you've got to weigh up the environmental impact of that. Um, the, the problem is there's so many studies out there, so many papers out there that argue completely different things and, 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 and believing what um, what we believe in which is the right way to go is is really tough but in any of these things i think whoever is responsible for removing or approving anything has to look at every single aspect and the knock-on effect um, of those decisions rob there's a question here asking presu presuming that rob grows uh, group four wheat varieties he mentioned that competitive varieties a part of his decision making process would he mind sharing what varieties he plants uh no yeah yeah that's fine not at all um so we're all group four feeds on the wheat uh, we've we've sort of uh we're moving towards more disease resistant varieties now that may or may not be competitive so we're now looking at a, a different aspect of it um a different act a, a different aspect of trying to reduce our um, how much we spend on the crop. So uh, what have we got in this time? Uh, Graham, Kinetic, uh, uh, Kerin, uh, 
mainly those three, I think. So it's all those sort of high yielding group fours, which uh, most of them are quite competitive anyway at those sort of high seed rates. Um, if you can get good establishment, um, then they will then they will get away. Um, uh, but we but we but we're moving towards things like Graham. Uh, there's a little bit of X days and Siskin in there, which I know aren't group fours, but we're looking at those for different reasons on a different trial as well mainly because of high disease resistant properties. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's, that's kind of where we're nudging towards now. Rob, is, is following, a, following ground a, a resort that Rob has led to? So I think what the person's asking is, yeah. have you followed land as a result of? Um, uh, not intentionally. Um, we did a webinar this morning on, on, on that subject when we were, uh, the last field that we came to drill in the spring that was supposed to have a winter wheat in it, and then it was going to have a spring barley in it, and in the end we decided not to drill it, so we followed it and we looked at what to do with that. I think fallow needs very careful consideration on your costs. It's it's it may well be a valuable way of um, you know 50% fallow, 50% wheat, or a, you know a, a, a wheat rape fallow or a wheat barley fallow or something like that may form a big part of um of how we farm in the future but i think if you're not careful with fallow you end up going back into a crop with a soil that is in very very poor condition uh, particularly on these heavy clays and heavy rainfalls through the winter uh, can do a hell of a lot of damage even in an average year so my concern about fallow would be that soil condition would go backwards if it's not um uh, if it's not taken out of fallow in the in the right way. Fantastic. Sarah, would you concur with those thoughts? What are your, your thoughts? I, th I think it's important when you've got fallow, you, you still have to manage the weeds there. You, you can't let them seed. And so you'll be busy making sure that the weeds aren't seeding by either cultivations or herbicides. Rob, there's quite a few questions coming in about um, why why don't you put a grass lay in? Do you want to just obviously I know the answer because I know you, but just kind of do you want to just explain why that's not really a huge option for you where you are? Um, yeah, you, you you've got to you've got to find something to do with it, and it's something that we've it's something that we've looked at, but there's not there's not a massive market for it around us. I've been in situations before where I've had to give away grass because i wanted it cleared and 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 off a small off a small field and nobody wanted it livestock's getting less and less around here um the opportunities for um, um local uh, sheep flocks to come and graze or, or or anything like that a few and far between in our area i know it can work very very well in some areas and i know some people are doing it very very successfully um but in but in our area you know having an outlet for the grass it's all very well sticking the grass in but you you, you can't just mow it for a couple of years and, and then work it back into the ground you've got to have an outlet for either a hay or a silage or um or you know a grazing license um and it, yeah, yeah the, they're few and far between around here perfect i think we've covered covered off everything coming in there there's quite a few of the similar similar subject uh, just before i close off um any other points for any of the any of the speakers before, before i draw us to a close perfect <laughs> um i just want to th thank thank the three of you rob this is your second webinar today let alone <laughs> or what i asked from you generally so um thank you very much and thank thank you paul and thank you sarah as well um it's just been kind of really valued um discussion um and it's kind of as, as i mentioned at the beginning we're in the middle of this trial and kind of and we're seeing how we're how we're going um chris if i could ask you to the, to the next slide please um that there, there are a lot of resources like i mentioned earlier or the all the um the harvest packs the harvest results packs so please please use those um to, to their advantage the next slide please christian there are also a lot of resources further afield you've got ahdb publications um you've got the hdb um, website and if you just type in hdb blackgrass um and and weed management you're going to get a kind of a hub and a plethora of information that you can use um from from the hdb um and like Teresa put this in hers this morning and i, I wasn't copying and pasting it i promise um but it's kind of farmers experiences today we've been listening to to what's been going on at rob's farm in warwickshire in, in the uk and then further afield in in, in denmark
so kind of learn from other people what they're doing what works and what doesn't there's no, as, we, as we said a few times there's no silver bullet to this and there's also the hdb um crop protection and ipm team um we, we at hdb we're, we're all here to to help you with, with with any such matters and kind of there's a team there that, that dedicate themselves to looking at um, crop protection ipm so don't be afraid to use them uh, next slide please christian so this is just one 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 um, part of a bigger series um watch watch all the videos that are going on this week take part in in all the webinars listen to the podcast download all the resources and at the end of the week I, there's even a a quiz to 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 kind of lend, end it on a light-hearted way um it's a big big joint effort it's not just us knowledge exchange managers doing it there's a lot of people behind the scenes my colleague christian is actually on the call behind the screens today kind of making all this technology work for us and we're very grateful to all of them for for, for doing that for us um next slide please christian next up in in the strategic farm winter week you've got the the, the next part of the the managed lower inputs um session which which was um exciting um for part one so part two but it kind of can't wait for the the second album um and then on thursday we've got the the flowering strips um seminar and then friday there's an ask the research um session researcher session where where we're inviting people to join us on teams microsoft teams and um ask have an open q a session with researchers and and kind of find out their developments and also have a kind of a bit of a useful discussion about where where you feel the industry should be going and what ACB, db should be doing final slide please um christian well, and i missed off there there's plenty of other stuff going on this winter as you can imagine we've got um we've got a huge amount of of, of activity at hdb um got monitor farm mondays um there's agronomy week so typically we'd have the agronomist conference in the first week of of december um but that's moved over to agronomy week and there's various other regional stuff going on all that leaves me to do is say thank you again to my speakers um, like i said at the beginning it's all recorded so if you go to the hdb serials and honesties youtube site it will be there in the next couple of days um, thank you very much for all the kind of insightful questions and and comments as we went through it makes it a lot easier for for, for my job uh, my contact details there if you have any specific questions or comments or queries there is a survey as you leave this we'd be really appreciate it if you did if you did give us feedback on that um, it really helps us to kind of grow and develop and, and take get, move on to the next things so um, it's always a bit odd ending one of these things, but I'm going to say, say good, goodbye there because I'll probably waffle on all night. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to the speakers again, and thank you all, and good night. <laughs>